I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to come and talk. I'm Greg Hayes. I'm the chief of vascular surgery here at Swedish, and I work with uh, Rod and his uh, spine group frequently, um, fortunately, infrequently regarding pitfalls. Um, you know, when you talk to spine surgeons that you're going to give a talk on this, almost everybody has a story that sticks in their mind. One event that occurs, and even Jens Chapman, who was out here earlier, you know, he said, well, I saw your talk. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss it. But I had this incident, yada, yada, yada. So everybody has one where they've uh, really experienced something. And if you haven't experienced it, it's, it's just a matter of time before you do. So we're going to briefly, very briefly discuss the, the anatomy of the uh, aorta and the iliac vessels uh, and the iliac arteries as they pertain to the spine. Um, and then discuss uh, what the incidence of this is, <clears throat> how do the injuries occur, um, some little trip, tips and tricks for getting out of trouble more than anything else, um, and really kind of dealing with the major complications, which uh, everybody knows can potentially be life-threatening. So the, the vascular anatomy primarily um, that we need to pay attention to. Um, I concentrate, you know, this discussion will be primarily concentrated on the, the lumbar sacral spine uh, is the bifurcation of the iliac vessels um, and the aorta and the uh, IVC. Um, so as you all know, the, uh, the iliac vein tends to run medial and posterior uh, to the left uh, iliac artery. Um, and that's important primarily when you're mobilizing the L4-5 segment, uh, be it either from an anterior approach or lateral approach, um, because you have to obviously move the uh, artery and then get access to the vein. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the money, I teach my residents and fellows that the money in this operation is, is uh, the iliolumbar vein. Uh, once you divide the, uh, get control of and divide the iliolumbar vein, then your, your operation gets a lot easier. A couple of tricks about the iliolumbar vein. Number one, um, it's frequently multiple. Uh, I think probably 10 to 15% of patients have two iliolumbar veins. So you've controlled one and then you get more aggressive with retracting the, uh, the iliac vein. And the next thing you know, you've torn off the second one. So always look for another one, uh, probably 10 to 15% of patients. Um, the other thing is that the L5 nerve root uh, always runs deep to the iliolumbar vein. So be very careful if you lose control of it down deep in the tissues that you're just not blindly putting clips down there and things of that nature. Uh, one of the neurosurgeons that I worked with um, uh, at the University of Florida did not want to put clips near the vein at all. Uh, he felt that a metal down near the nerve was not a good idea. Um, I like to try to tie the vein off, uh, but you should, I, I always point out to people that I'm teaching to actually look for it. I like to see it so I know exactly where it is. And that way we won't, we won't injure it. Um, couple of other things. The sympathetic trunk, trunk runs along there. Patients will come back. They won't complain of coldness uh, or they won't complain of warmth in the leg that you've operated on. They'll complain that their other leg feels cold. And typically that's because you've divided, you've sympathectomized the left lower extremity. So they don't come back and say, oh, my left leg's warm. They come back. Um, the lymphatics are uh, run through the area. Patients will occasionally come back and complain of some swelling in the left lower extremity. Uh, that can be a mild form of lymphedema. I asked one of my mentors when I was learning these techniques if uh, he warned the patients about that. And he said, no, he never did, because then they start looking for it uh, and they'll come back and complain about it. But it's not a major problem. I've never seen anybody. I've never seen an individual who actually had uh, severe lymphedema from that dissection. You can, however, get uh, lymphocytes, And um, uh, we had a misdiagnosis uh, on one occasion of a large lymphocyte that the radiologist read as a, a, a uroma, and it was not. It was actually a lymphocyte. And the way to determine that is to get a sample and obviously send it off for creatinine. If the creatinine is, is at uh, 
uh, extra astronomically high levels, you've obviously injured the ureter. If it's in the normal range, then it's a lymphocele. So um, just briefly, uh, quickly, the old fashioned uh, L5 S1 A lift, um, you know, you, you make, a I typically make a transverse incision if we do multiple levels. You can see uh, uh, I'll use uh, sort of oblique, more oblique incisions, depending on what levels we do. It seems these days that the majority of the uh, three, four, four, five levels are done from some oblique or, or lateral approach. So typically we only do uh, one level at a lift, uh, a five, one seem rarely we'll do a four or five, but um, it's clear it's not as often as we used to do it. Um, the anatomy of that, again, uh, you can see the ileal lumbar vein pointed out there in the slide. Um, and uh, the four or five dissection is really generally pretty easy. Uh, it's the one that uh, uh, beginners should start with. Uh, you know, the chance of injury is fairly low. The, I did have on one occasion very, very early in my career, we actually avulsed the, uh, the middle sacral artery right off of the aorta that, that proved to be a painful experience. I've never done it since, but it was very early on in my career. Um, minor bleeding. If you experience minor bleeding from veins, do not place sutures. Uh, the, by far the majority of minor bleeding will stop on its own. And uh, earlier, Vanita Chandra was talking about her exposure technique. Um, you can uh, put your retractor in there, put a little gel foam or something of that nature on the minor bleeding. If you put a suture in the vein, your DVT rate is about 20%. Large trials have shown that as soon as you start suturing the vein, even a, even a small 6O or 5O proline, as soon as you repair the vein, your DVT rate goes way up. So we really try to avoid repairing the vein if we can. And it's quite surprising how large a um, defect or avulsion you can get in the vein, you retract it, put it underneath some uh, thrombostatic agents and do your procedure and then come back and release the retractor and it's no longer bleeding. So we don't automatically jump to suturing. At the four or five level, obviously it's much more important that you divide the iliolumbar vein. Uh, this is the level where we see most of the injuries uh, is four or five, if you're gonna do a four or five A lift. Uh, the majority of uh, vascular injuries occur at this level, um, the most common one being venous. Uh, there's usually a small branch of the external iliac artery that will arise uh, and go laterally. That can typically just be treated with either a small clip or bipolar cautery. Oops. So anterior spine surgery, what's the true incidence of uh, injury? Well, I think, uh, again, um, my discussion with Jens earlier, a, uh, I think it, it, it is underreported on all likelihood. And I think one of the reasons it's underreported is that um, how we define injury. I think the, uh, the incidence of life-threatening or hemodynamically compromising injury is relatively low but the, the uh, actual incidence of minor injuries to the veins uh, specifically is, is uh, much more significant. Arterial injuries tend to be less frequent. Obviously injuries in reduced surgery are increased. And here is actually an article by one of our esteemed directors. And actually this is an excellent article, Bob. It really was. I, I, su I suspect that you wrote this when you're a medical student or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's actually one of the best papers uh, published in terms of looking at uh, arterial and venous injuries. And uh, the, really, I think the thing to point out here more than any other is that, again, it was at that four or five level where they saw the majority of injuries and, uh, and, and increased injuries and in redo procedures. So why do injuries occur and how do they occur? Well, in the venous circulation, they're primarily uh, either lacerations of the vein or they are uh, um, avulsions of branches. The most common injury um, that I've been involved with in terms of uh, having to come in and really get involved in terms of controlling bleeding has been a laceration to the vein. 
And these can be life-threatening events. Uh, they should not be taken lightly. And we'll talk a little bit more about when, uh, how to deal with significant injuries. Arterial injuries, uh, beware of patients who have a lot of atherosclerosis. They've got a lot of plaque. You see their CT scan. They've got calcified vessels, um, uh, cath uh, calcified plaque. Uh, the real problem there is, is retracting the vessels and then cracking that plaque and creating the dissection. Bleeding is less common. Thrombosis and dissection is more common. Um, one of the things that I do if we're going to do a fairly extensive uh, retraction of the artery uh, the, uh, in terms of a three, four, four, five is put a uh, pulse ox on the left foot. It's a very accurate means of measuring if there's an injury. So we put an elf pulse ox on the hallux, uh, determine what it is, uh, pre-op, and then when you're finished, you put it back on. And if it's dropped 100% of the time, you got an injury and you need to seek and find out what it is. So we, we will often put it on before we close, especially in patients who were suspicious may have an injury. Preoperative planning is very, very important, especially in redo cases. Um, the spine surgeon and the access surgeon should really get together and look at the films together and um, determine you know, what the approach is going to be and what the potential difficulties we may, be, uh, we may come across. And the preop planning also in terms of uh, whether they have duplications or duplications of the cava. Sometimes you can see more than one iliac vein. Uh, they're rare, but, but there are things you want to see prior to your surgery. So vascular injury tips. First and foremost, again, uh, know, know the enemy is what I say. And so uh, make sure you've reviewed the films before you get in there. Uh, Talk to the patient about any previous surgeries they may have had. Uh, the very first case I did here with Bob Hart, the patient had actually had a kidney transplant. So, uh, and the kidney was sitting in the left iliac fossa. So, unfortunately, the patient needed a 5 1. We were able to just go over to the other side. But, uh, you know, that would have been a significant problem if we hadn't discussed some preoperative planning. Have your game plan. Uh, redo anterior spine surgery is very dangerous uh, in anybody's hands, and there are techniques that we can use to reduce the incidence of complications. So what I have started to do is if we know we're going to do a redo spine case, and I'm going to present one example case here, um, I will always have the urologist put up a ureteric stent, uh, and I will also put a wire up. Uh, the left iliac vein now, if we're going to go from left, uh, left sided approach, having the wire up the left iliac vein is going to give us uh, an opportunity that if we develop any significant bleeding, we can control the vein with a balloon very easily. And that wire doesn't really get in any, any of your trouble at all. Again, as we talked about, um, avoid repairing minor venous lacerations or injuries because they're significantly associated with increased deep venous thrombosis and the pulse ox on the left hallux. So what do you do when you actually have a major complication, what we call audible bleeding? So, you know, you're, you're working away, um, and these are typically venous injuries, as you know. Um, what, what do we do? Well, the first thing that one should do is slow down and, and really take your own pulse. Uh, so you, you got to calm down. 99% of the time, you can control these bleeds with pressure. Um, and then you need to start problem solving. Uh, don't be afraid to call for help. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, if you're doing the case on your own and you don't have an access surgeon or a vascular surgeon there, go ahead and give them a call and stop doing what you're doing and wait until they get there. Uh, we did have one instance here in the past in a redo operation where I actually told the spine surgeon, I need another pair of vascular fingers. <laughs> and, and he was actually fine with that. He said, that's okay. Uh, and we got another vascular surgeon in to help me in a redo case. So uh, don't be afraid to back out and live, another, live for another day. So uh, 
uh, if you have uh, severe bleeding, especially if you're doing some sort of minimally uh, uh, minimal access surgery, you don't have a lot of access to the uh, artery tip or to the artery or vein. Typically, the vein um, uh, pack it, tamponade it. Um, the patients are frequently in a, in a lateral decubitus position. That's not a good position for us to work from a vascular point of view. Um, if you can get control of it um, and stop the bleeding, then you can actually put the patient in the ICU, get a CT scan, make a plan, get, get a plan to come back and do something another day. Multidisciplinary, don't be afraid to call for help, uh, specifically if you're up in the chest, the, car, the uh, thoracic surgeons, if you're in the belly or in the retroperitoneum, call for the vascular surgeon or your access surgeon, maybe a general surgeon to come help you. Endovascular solutions are um, evolving. Uh, for the vein, they're very difficult. And the reason for that is that the vein is quite often quite large. and We don't have covered stents. Uh, that will that will um, adequately fill the vein. Um, in many of these patients, the vein may be 14, 15, 16 millimeters in diameter, and our covered stents often don't get that large. So if you're going to do uh, redo uh, revision uh, surgery, anterior lumbar surgery, um, a couple of things. Again, make sure that you uh, plan adequately preoperatively. Uh, think about putting in some ureteric stents, wire uh, endovascular technique, wire in the left iliac vein. Um, uh, get some blood, have blood available, use a cell saver. Uh, make sure that the uh, anesthesiologist knows that they're uh, what you're doing. So uh, planning ahead is really going to avoid a lot of these complications that occur. So here is... Um, um, some issues in revision surgery. First of all, is it the same level or is it a different level? Um, is it early or is it late? Uh, surgeries that are early, you know, less than 10 days or so, uh, the dissection plane is usually still there. If it's later than that, then often uh, the dissection may be much more difficult. Um, are you going to take a retroperitoneal approach or can you go transperitoneal, uh, which occasionally we do, fairly rarely though. Make sure that you warn uh, males about retrograde ejaculation. Uh, that's very, very important because if you don't warn them about it and, uh, and they sue you, you will probably lose. <laughs> so you should, you should uh, make sure that you discuss that with them and document that you have discussed that with them. Um, so make sure uh, your approach, uh, look at the imaging, discuss it with the spine surgeon. Uh, from my point of view, make sure the spine surgeon discusses it with the access surgeon and then look at other approaches. Can, can you use an anterior lateral uh, uh, retroperitoneal approach as opposed to an anterior approach? Uh, can you go at it from a different level in terms of uh, working your way to the injury or to the site that you're going to redo by starting in more virginal territory and working your way down to it. So here's a challenging case that uh, we had here at the institution here, a 46-year-old uh, who was actually a, um, a paratrooper who had injured his back many uh, several years ago, 20 years ago, a very fit guy, um, muscular, uh, worked out frequently, he had L4-5 uh, disease, um, and he underwent a procedure on April the 4th of a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see the lumbar discectomy that was all done through an old lift technique and a posterior fusion. So he then presented um, about two months later, which is really bad time to present, and you can see he presented with... Uh, recurrent back pain, and you can see from this film that uh, it looks like he's prolapsed the uh, prosthesis anteriorly significantly. In the first film, it looks like that prosthesis may be slightly anterior, but he's clearly prolapsed it significantly anteriorly here two months post-op. This is, um, let's see if I can get this to run. So this is CT. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> Rod just, Rod just said, Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, he's really prolapsed this anteriorly, as you can see, he's having a lot of pain. I'll let that run through a couple of times. There you go. So we didn't have, we didn't have many options, but to go ahead and treat him. Let's do one more time. And on this film, you'll see that he has, uh, you can see the relationship of the iliac vein to that prosthesis. The prosthesis is sort of obscuring the view a little bit, but you can see as a large left common iliac vein that is coursing right along where that prosthesis has prolapsed. So um, this was a very challenging case. Fortunately, we were able, what, what we did, uh, we did put a, a, a ureteric stent in place and we put a wire up the left iliac vein. Uh, we were able to identify everything. We didn't have any major injuries. Uh, we were able to get the procedure done. It was uh, a little nerve wracking, but uh, fortunately there, but by planning and making sure that we had all the imaging and knew where the vessels were lying in terms of uh, the prosthesis itself, we were prepared. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, vascular complications are relatively rare uh, with proper planning and meticulous surgical technique. They can be, they can be uh, minimalized in terms of their incidence. Um, once an injury has occurred, um, slow down, um, decide whether you want to come back another day, call for help. Um, these can be life-threatening events and uh, make sure that uh, you get the help that you need, get the blood that you need, get the cell saver available and uh, um, anesthesia understands the magnitude of the injury. Um, and uh, injuries are increased in anterior lateral redo surgery. Uh, and when you're dealing with injury, uh, don't be afraid to think outside the box in terms of how can we uh, really kind of problem solve and get this patient off the table safely, uh, which will be the major goal at that point in time. Thanks, everybody. That was terrific. Um, thanks, Greg. Uh, obviously, we're fortunate um, in that, you know, we have someone like yourself here at Swedish um, what's your advice to surgeons doing minimally act invasive or minimal access surgery, um, in terms of, uh, doing these, um, let's say like five, one, for example, um, would you recommend that, that, um, let's say if they're d doing a, um, five, one approach minimally invasively, do you think they should have an access surgeon or, or do you think, is it just based on experience and your comfort level? Well, I think to some extent it's, it's, it, it depends on your comfort level, yeah. but I mean, the safest thing is to clearly have an access surgeon there as we saw with Vanita Chandra this morning, who was doing that very intricate dissection and excellently done. Uh, you know, I know, I know Vanita very well. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to, I would say if you're going to do it yourself, make sure that you have someone that you can call if an event occurs. So make sure that, that you've got the backup that you need. Um, it's really what people are comfortable with and what their training has allowed them to do. Um, being an access surgeon myself, I'm, I, I really like to do this surgery. So from that point of view, you know, yes, I would say I like to be called and I like to do it, mm -hmm. but if you're going to do it yourself, 
uh, just make sure that you have the backup in case, uh, in case an event should occur. Yeah. Neil had his hand up. Neil. Yeah, yeah, Greg, thank you. That was really wonderful, your talk. And I'm glad you brought that case up with the dislodged interbody spacer. That is way, way more common than people think. And I think one of the biggest reasons that among all our colleagues who were discussing is that's an inadvertent rupture of the ALR. It's already gone on the left side. So it spins out. Many a time it doesn't come all the way out. This was luckily on the IVC. And that's why I always say you got to see the ALR. If you don't see it, this is what happens. It's very common. I've seen a lot of this, unfortunately. Luckily, most patients are fine, but you guys handled it great. And this was obviously that spun right out. And uh, but thank you for showing that and great cases indeed. For 5 1 now, I agree with you. I think we do our 5 1s there, but I much rather have the vascular guide, but I don't want to repair it. It's bad enough in supine to get a repair. Now, to do it in lateral, it's a different ballgame, a much better having a vascular person there for that lateral 5 1 and actually take care of the left internal yak wind that keeps coming in your way. So I would certainly say you guys are extremely helpful. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Great. So uh, thanks, Greg. Nuj, I like that. I like that beard. <laughs> <laughs> Nuj, when you're muted. I, I, I was saying that I grow it out for each SSF talk, um, but uh, um, actually, Greg, I have a question too. I, I think Neil kind of really touched on it, and that is about the lateral ALIF. You know, uh, we, we've done several of these and for a while we were going through a phase where we were very excited about doing them because we could keep the patient in the same position. Um, but we found that the, the greatest inhibitory factor was the vasculature. Um, would you just comment on whether, you know, from a lateral position, this has been a problem, could be a problem, whether you have an opinion one way or the other to do to tackle five one from a lateral perspective versus supine, um, is it just us, or is this is this something something that you know is across the board with difficulty um, in accessing that disc? Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, if you want to call it controversy or uh, whatever it be. I hear a lot of feedback from spine surgeons regarding their opinions of, uh, you know, o OLIF or you know, some lateral approach to 5-1. Um, I, I think that if you're comfortable and the patient's anatomy is appropriate, that, you know, the 5-1 approach from an OLIF type approach, which Vanita showed earlier today, is, is safe. But as soon as you try to... Uh, push the edge of the envelope a little bit, that's, that's when you start to get into trouble. Um, so if the, uh, I think it's really dependent on each individual and their anatomy. Um, but I, I think in, in properly selected cases, it can be safely done. Yeah, that's great to hear. No, thank you. That's, that's good. 